Takeda Pharmaceuticals North America is proud to sponsor this important and quality programming for ReachMD listeners. Takeda does not control the editorial content of this broadcast. The views expressed are solely those of the guests who are selected by the AGA Institute. Based in Deerfield, Illinois, Takeda Pharmaceuticals North America is a wholly owned subsidiary of Takeda Pharmaceutical Company Limited, the largest pharmaceutical company in Japan. In the United States, Takeda markets products for diabetes, insomnia, wakefulness, and gastroenterology, and is developing products in the areas of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and other conditions. Takeda is committed to striving toward better health for individuals and progress in medicine by developing superior pharmaceutical products. To learn more about the company and its products, visit www.tpna.com. You are listening to ReachMD XM157, the channel for medical professionals. Welcome to GI Insights, where we cover the latest clinical issues, trends, and technologies in gastroenterological practice. GI Insights is brought to you by AGA Institute and sponsored by Takeda Pharmaceuticals North America. Your host for GI Insights is Professor of Medicine at University of Illinois Chicago, Dr. Jay Goldstein. We're living in times of difficulty in funding, or maybe not so. Joining me today is uh, Dr. Philip Toskis, Professor of Medicine in the Division of Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition at the University of Florida College of Medicine in Gainesville. Dr. Toskis was the first chairman of the Digestive Health Initiative and a founding member of the American Digestive Health Foundation. He also was a a founding member of the Federated Societies for Gastroenterology and Hepatology, and of course, former president of the AGA in 1997. Dr. Toskis, welcome to ReachMD. Thank you very much. Well, let's get right down to the topic. Uh, Funding. NIH funding, is it available, readily available, none of the above, all of the above? I guess it's, it's sort of all of the above. NIH funding is tough now with our resources being utilized in Afghanistan as well as in Baghdad. And yet, I think that research, which this country has done so well, has to continue. And so it's important to recognize that NIH still puts out a significant amount of money. It's getting tougher to get. And for example, if you look at the many different grants that they give, let's just take the classical R01, which is an individual investigator-related project, The pay line now is about 12%. If you are a new investigator, a young person, it's a little better. It's 14%. However, there are other grants that pay at a much easier level. And uh, I would like to point out, for example, that the K grants may have a priority score of founding at 1.60, which is so much easier than the R01. The R21, which is an exploratory grant, funds at a 140 priority score. And then finally, the small business grant mechanism, which Congress has been very, very pleased with, and a certain percentage of money has been allocated to that, that is not very hard to get. The basic point is that an investigator from an academic center partners with a person from small business, and their talents then are combined to do research that often produces a product that then can be utilized to help the small business go forward and make it be a profitable venture. I've had 12 of these with a partner that I will talk a little bit about as we go on from MIT who has his own small business, which has been quite successful, and he measures carbon-13 labeled CO2. And much of the work that I do with probes involves labeling with carbon-13. Well, why do you think that Congress is so hyped on these small business research loans? Well, I think Congress believes that small businesses are really the the heart of American success, and they have increased the amount of money devoted to small business grants uh, consistently. And they're not going to go away. And In fact, if they're being funded now at a priority score of uh, 215, look how much better that is than some of the other grants we've just discussed. Well, are these types of uh, research grants solely related to clinical medicine, or do they go into the translational area or uh, even into the basic science area? I think they go into all areas. I think a lot of the grants, when they first were started, were mostly clinical, but a lot of the clinical work has become translational. I was just helping a young member of our faculty who has a very translational-type grant in cancer, 
just meet with a company and they now have something that they're about to partner with. So I think that we haven't always done that as well as we could have, but I think academia now is recognizing that uh, lots of things have to be tried that may be different. Well, the driving point in academia is often the degree of salary support and the indirects associated with the granting process. Right. Let's go back to some of the traditional grants like the R01s and the K awards. They differ in those areas, don't they? They do. They do. You want to explain that a little bit to us? Well, I think that it, it depends on uh, what, uh, how much, uh, for a young investigator, often they're providing a modicum of money for salary, and basically they expect the academic institution to come forth and support a lab and personnel and so forth, and this is the NIH trying to give this young man or young woman a jump start. So I think those kind of grants are not huge grants in terms of money amounts, but they are a step in the right direction. It's been explained to me that uh, the R01 support the research concept, whereas the K awards are really focused in on the individual. Is that a fair summary statement? That is a fair understanding. I mean, there are lots of things that are still going on that are helpful. We've had a T32 training grant sure. since I can remember at our place, and that pays for the salaries of four individuals a year who are then apt to go into academic medicine. Now, if you don't have a product that goes into academic medicine but goes into practice, you don't maintain that grant. So it's very clear what the government wants, and you have to know what they want and see whether you fit into that equation. Well, let's focus in on the uh, person who is starting out their early academic career. We've gotten over the hurdle of making a decision about career choices, but they're now going into academics. What do you advise people to go for these K awards or to go jump into an R01? And are we really developing young trainees coming out of fellowship who can actually compete for an R01? Well, it's getting tougher. The science is more complex. The competition is very keen because some of the senior people who have been funded for a long time are now finding themselves in difficulty getting funded. And then, of course, that then affects the total pool that's trying to get funded. NIH has tried to recognize that and isolate and identify some grants only for people starting out. And if you look at a grant, say let's say someone's on a T32 training grant, and then they finish that, they can then go into a new grant, like an R21 or something like that, and then try to match that or partner that with some of the funds that come from a lot of private foundations and societies. And there is quite a lot of funding in that pot as well. If you just tuned in, you're listening to GI Insights on ReachMD XM 157, the channel for medical professionals. I'm your host, Dr. Jay Goldstein, and joining me today to discuss funding opportunities in this relatively unstable funding environment is Dr. Philip Taskis, Professor of Medicine in the Division of Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition at the University of Florida College of Medicine. Well, let's turn our attention. We've kind of summarized, if you will, the NIH opportunities, federal funding at different levels, at different rates for different individuals, and a good understanding of those may help optimize funding. But let's turn our attention to other sources of funding out there. Uh, you've been involved in the uh, AGA, the uh, American Digestive Health Foundation, and other national organizations, as well as, I'm sure, some of the private organizations. What are the funding opportunities there? They are quite abundant. And let me just mention some of the ones that I've been involved with. The National Pancreatic Foundation, I sit on their governing board, and that is a group that has raised money outside of NIH parameters to help get young people to go into pancreatology. And they give out grants, career grants, for up to $50,000 a year as starter grants. We recently looked at what those people did, and it's really remarkable how many parlay that into an R01. So it's hard for the young person to get their first step into the funding business. So that kind of a situation helps them. The Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, for a long time, has been very good at providing funding for young investigators. The AGA Institute has a good amount of grants and grant money that young people can compete for. And again, they are favoring young investigators to try to get them in that bridging time to continue in academic medicine. The American College of Gastroenterology, the American Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy have less amounts of money to give out in this vein, but they also support young investigators. The American Liver Foundation is a very handsome source of funding, and there are many, many, many more. One has to have a mentor who they can sit down with and make these kinds of opportunities 
clear and available to the young person. Well, if you were advising a young investigator just leaving training on uh, funding opportunities and how to proceed, do you go for the biggie or do you do it stepwise and, and move from smaller grants and career development awards to greater awards? And by the way, we need to talk a little bit about the VA also. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. There are lots of different ways to do this. I traditionally have favored someone coming off of a training grant at T32 to basically then try to get a K-series award. And now those other awards that are for younger people, like the Ks and uh, other grants like the R21, which is an exploratory grant for new ideas, those are the ones to start with. And then you, depending on how evolving and how successful this young man or woman's career is, you may then go into some of the more traditional grants. So I think that's the way to go. All right. Well, let's turn our attention the last couple of minutes here to the VA. Is a career in the VA with funding a uh, good, bad, or just another option? I think it's another option. I began my work at Florida when I came down from the Walter Reed Research Institute in the VA. And the VA allowed me to go through my clinical responsibilities and in my research in a less stressful manner than it would be had it had been at the university. And I got a career award from the VA and basically had R01s at the same time. And I found that that was a nice place to sort of grow up, if you will, and get yourself accustomed to the laboratory. The VA has had some interesting things go forth. If you're interested in clinical research and epidemiological research and outcomes research, the VA is a very good place to be. And they do well with those kinds of studies. Uh, the first two words that come to my mind are foster and nurture. Yes, right. And we try to continue to do that here. It's not always easy because sometimes it's not clear what the VA is understanding about what the needs are. And I think that people have said, why do you need a VA research program when you have the NIH? And I think that uh, there is room for both of these sources because, after all, it's the VA that uh, research program that often attracts good physicians to stay in the VA system. Well, we could probably spend the next hour talking about these opportunities and funding opportunities uh, for the future, but we're going to have to bring it to a close. I'd like to thank my guest, Dr. Phil Toskis, for uh, speaking with us today about funding opportunities. Thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you very much. You have been listening to GI Insights on ReachMD XM157, the channel for medical professionals. GI Insights is brought to you by AGA Institute and sponsored by Takeda Pharmaceuticals North America. For additional information on this program and on-demand podcasts, visit us at ReachMD.com and use promo code AGA.